If you will, if you'll take your Bibles and open them this morning to Psalm 63. Psalm 63 this morning. You know, as you're turning in the scriptures, I wanted to again encourage all of us to be much in prayer for Israel and um, and that whole region. Um, it is, as, as many of you know, I just returned from Israel um, less than a month before um, that war began and before Israel was attacked by Hamas. And um, our original dates for the trip, um, we moved the dates, we moved them back. The original dates of the trip would have put us there when the war began. Now, God is in the details, amen? amen. And uh, we felt we needed to move the trip back, <coughs> one, because it saved us on some cost quite a bit, but God was in the details, and we're so thankful. Um, I am so thankful, and if I had it to do over again, I would go again, um, because it was such an incredible time, an incredible trip. It breaks my heart. Uh, I know Connect Church, they were planning a trip, um, taking about 50 people in November, and they've had to completely cancel their trip. And my heart hurts for them, and I'm disappointed for them. But I'm so thankful that I got to go, and already uh, the trip has impacted my preaching and, and teaching, and I know that it will for years to come. I'm going to be teaching uh, from uh, that trip this morning some as we talk about one of the places we visited. And the psalm that we're looking at is a psalm of David today. And David, uh, David found his satisfaction in his relationship with the Lord. David walked through some very difficult things, as many of you have walked through, and some of you are walking through now. But you know what? That's a part of life, is it not? The hurts, the ups and the downs, the hills and the valleys... Uh, we have times of celebration, we have times of joy, we have times of happiness, but we also have times of hurt, times of grief, times of disappointment, and I don't know if you realized it yet, your dreams don't always work out, and uh, things in life can take a turn, but the hope that we have as believers in Christ is that there is a God in heaven who loves us. There is a God in heaven who is sovereign, who is in the details more than we realize, who probably protects us more often than we know. But we rest on those things. And whenever you begin to focus in on your walk and your relationship with Jesus, you can find satisfaction in life. When you think of satisfaction, when you think of being satisfied, where do you find it? What do you need to, what do you need? I want you to think about that for yourself. What do you need to experience satisfaction? Have you ever thought about it? We could talk about this on many different levels, can't we? Sometimes we get a craving for something that nothing else will satisfy. Do you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes I get a craving for pizza. And nothing else will satisfy, my, and satisfy me until I go and have, have a good pizza. The best pizzas I think around are Big Ed's Pizza at Oak Ridge. Uh, Brother Benji, that's my favorite pizza in all the world, I think. Uh, but Tennessee Pizza Company, they do a really good job too. But everybody loves a good pizza. And then sometimes nothing will satisfy me but a Krispy Kreme donut. You know what I'm talking about. That Sunday school class that meets right back here, they have an addiction to donuts. <laughs> and, and any donut will do. It doesn't have to be Krispy Kreme. But we all, there are things that, you know, we think about our physical bodies. There are things that we look to to satisfy our cravings. How about a place? What place satisfies your heart? Home satisfies me. There's no place like home, amen? I look forward to traveling. I love to travel. I love to go on mission trips. That trip to Israel was absolutely incredible. But there's something about coming home. Home to people you know and love and who you know loves you. And no place satisfies us quite like home. When you're home with your children, your spouse, your brothers, your sisters, your loved ones, 
your friends. Nothing satisfies us quite like quality time with those we love dearly. <coughs> Places satisfy my heart a lot. I love the mountains and the beach. They bring me a great deal of satisfaction. They bring a peace. Um, the mountains and the beach remind me of God's grandeur, of his majesty, of his power. And I find peace there. I know many of you do as well. But listen, there is a deeper satisfaction that none of those things can fill and provide. It's true. For you see, we are made for him, the Lord. And until we uh, realize that this relationship is the one we were created for, there will always be a void, an emptiness that nothing else can touch. Uh, the Westminster Catechism says this, man's chief end, in other words, the reason we're here is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever, to enjoy him. You see, it's in that relationship with God that we find our greatest joy and satisfaction. John Piper said this, he said, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And so where do we find our greatest satisfaction? We find it in our walk in relationship with, with the Lord. Uh, there is a hymn we sing. Uh, Benji knows this hymn. Satisfied. Listen to the words of this hymn we sing. All my life long I have panted for a drink from some cool spring that I hoped would quench the burning of the thirst I felt within. And then he answers, hallelujah, he has found me, the one my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longings, and through his blood I now am saved. Feeding on the filth around me till my strength was almost gone. Long my soul for something better, only still to hunger on. But hallelujah, he has found me, the one my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies all my longings, and through his blood I now am saved. Poor I was and sought for riches, something that would satisfy. But the dust I gathered round me only mocked my soul's sad cry. Hallelujah. He has found me. The one my soul so long has craved, Jesus satisfies all my longings. Through his blood I now am saved. And I love this last verse. Well of water ever springing, bread of life so rich and free, untold wealth that never faileth, my Redeemer is to me. Hallelujah, he has found me, the one my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies all my longings through his blood. I now am saved. Aren't you thankful for Jesus? He's the only one that can satisfy our hearts. David knew that. I want us to go, I want you to read this beautiful psalm with me. And then I want to point out several things about David's relationship with the Lord and what he knew. Psalm 63. David writes this prayer in the first, uh, first part of this psalm. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. So we can see something of David's life there. He had a habit of seeking God early in the day. He said, early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and a thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Isn't that beautiful? Let's read on. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Something interesting I read about verse 6 there. You know, David was human just like we are. There was a lot on David's heart and a lot on David's mind. David, too, had nights where he didn't sleep well. We know that because there in verse 6, he says, I meditate on you in the night watches. 
in the night watches, every, every segment of the night. There were some nights David was awake all through the night. And he said, when he had one of those nights, he said, I remember you on my bed. I meditate on you in the night watches. Dear friend, if you have a night and, you, and you're struggling and you can't find peace and you're worried, the best thing you can do is meditate on the goodness of the Lord. Amen? Verse 7, because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. That image there in verse 8. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. The image there is of a father holding the hand of his child. You know, you think about uh, the parents in this room. Would you have a little one? And maybe you get out of the car and you're about to cross the street and you grab the hand of your child and you hold on to that child. It doesn't really matter how, how much of a grip that child has on you because you've got the grip on that child. And that is a picture of our Heavenly Father. And that's what David, that's the picture he is painting for us. Um, and so he holds us. He holds our very hand and he upholds us. Verse 9 says, But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory. But the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. And so I want to walk through and point out some things that David knew about the Lord. Where did David find his satisfaction? Now, now I want to tell you something that is pretty incredible about this psalm. And... David is talking about early will I seek you, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh longs for you in a dry and a thirsty land where there is no water. One day in Israel, we visited, uh, we went into the desert. We had a day, I call it the desert day. I remember it well. It was the hottest hot I've ever felt. I thought I was going to turn into a uh, a crispy, one of those crispy Cheetos or something out there in the sun. I just felt like the, the sun and the heat was pulling every ounce of water out of my body. And all I wanted to do was drink water. And the colder, the better. I wanted cold water. I felt like I could drink a gallon by myself. It was, that's the only thing that would quench that kind of thirst. And... So one day we were out there in the desert area. We visited the Dead Sea that day. And let me tell you, it's dead. I wasn't real impressed with the Dead Sea. Yes, you can float in the water. You won't sink. I, I laid back in the water and my feet popped up. And, and I was so buoyant, I couldn't get my feet back down to the bottom to stand up. I had to have help. It's like a turtle on its back. Help. And not even the Dead Sea. I think the reason, one of the reasons I was so unimpressed with the Dead Sea, there wasn't a bit of life in it. There wasn't a plant near it. It was dead. It looked dead. And I thought, surely, when I get in that water, it's going to cool me off. No. It was like stepping into tepid bath water. I was already hot and sweaty. Already wanted something cool, anything cool, but that sea offered no comfort. Well, we left the Dead Sea. There was another place we visited that day, and that's the place I want to talk to you about today. What does it have to do with our message in Psalm 63? Well, it's believed that David probably wrote the words to this psalm at this very place. It's called En Gedi. It's there in the desert. It's west of the Dead Sea, just west of the Dead Sea. Um, it is arid, it is dry, it is desert. There are mountainous cliffs with not a tree anywhere to be seen on those cliffs, not a patch of green anywhere. Arid, hot, dry. And um, so you can begin to see as David wrote the words to Psalm 63, 
O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and a thirsty land where there is no water. And he was talking about how he longed for a relationship with the Lord. And nothing else could satisfy. Let me explain a little bit more why David was there at En Gedi. He was running and hiding um, because King Saul was after him. King Saul wanted to kill him. You know, we read about that in the scripture and we think, oh, David ran from King Saul for a little while. But do you know it was the minimum time he ran from King Saul that I read in commentary was seven years. You think about David, anointed as the king of Israel, the next king of Israel, as, as a boy by the prophet Samuel. And then he had to keep tending sheep after he was anointed as the future king. And then when he finally stepped up and people noticed him when he went up against Goliath, and the people started talking about David, more than they were talking about King Saul. And King Saul became jealous. And the people would come out in the streets and they would say, King Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. And they began to, to look at David. King Saul became very jealous and, and wanted David, wanted him done away with. And so he began to pursue David. To take his very life. And David hid in this place that we visited called En Gedi. We pulled up. We were driving through the desert. And we pulled up to this place. All of a sudden we saw a place that looked like a little oasis. It had date palms. I've just come out of nowhere in this arid, hot, dry, dusty desert. And we saw these date palms. We pulled up at the bus. There was the, the, the welcome center to this area, to this park, to En Gedi. We got off the bus, and then we walked through, and we followed a long path back through the desert. Did I mention to you it was hot? <laughs> it was hot, y'all. There were people who were chose to sit under the trees instead of going to see where we were going to see. It was that hot. But I pressed on and, and we pressed on because I wanted to see this place. And we began to see little cave, little caves up on the cliffs and the hillsides. And it was said that they, that, that was where David hid and ran from King Saul. And where they believed that many of the Psalms were, were written. And so we finally come to this place that almost seemed to be a miracle. There near the Dead Sea where everything was dead, hot. No, I would not want to move there. And we walked back this path. There were cliffs and caves there or kind of around surrounding this little, what came to be a little oasis. And I want you to see what we saw. Adam. You don't have anything? <laughs> we'll have it for you in just a second. Um, sorry about that, Adam. Uh, Justin's on his way. I'll show you that here in just a second. But we came to this little oasis. And there was this spring of water. You'll see it here in just a minute. This spring of water gushing out of one of these hot, arid, desert cliffs. And all around this spring of water, it was fresh water, by the way, it was gushing out, and it looked like the most refreshing thing I have ever seen. I wanted to go sit under it. And it's called the waterfall of David. And it is believed that that's where David hid. It is believed that that's where he wrote many of these psalms. And when you be, begin to see that, and I, I could imagine David sitting there on a rock, looking at that spring of water gushing out, going over and getting a cool drink scooped up with his hand, and he and his men. And it was a place where they were refreshed. It was a place where he was reminded of God's faithfulness. 
and of God's goodness. Even in the middle of a desert, in the middle of the heat, in the middle of no life anywhere, God managed to bring a beautiful spring out of all of that barrenness. The whole Bible begins to come to life. As Jesus talked about him being the what? The living water. And David said, oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and a thirsty land where there is no water. That's it. It's been gushing there for thousands of years. This desert where there is no water. And there you can see the plant life that has come to life around that spring. There you can see the barrenness and the dryness of the cliffs. And that is the area where it is believed that David wrote many of these psalms. And I wonder if he was sitting by that very spring one day as he penned these words to Psalm 63. And what we learn is that God is a personal God and he is a life-giving God. Amen? In the, in the middle of death, in the middle of everything, God can, bring, God can bring life. And David understood his soul thirst for God. His, his flesh longed for him. He said, in a, in, a, in a dry and a thirsty land where there is no water. And he said, so I have looked for you. In the sanctuary because David understood that God is a personal God. See what he said in verse 1. Oh God, you are my God. Yes, God is the God of, the, uh, of, of humanity. He's the God who created us all. But David had a relationship with God. He, he knew God and he knew God was life-giving David, who was running for his life, understood that his only hope was to press in to this life-giving God who cared for him and watched out for him, who was faithful. I'll never read that psalm the same way again. But if you can imagine, David, seven years of hiding Seven years of waiting on God to deliver you. I wonder how many prayers David prayed there in Gedi. Sometimes it seems that you're stuck where you are, doesn't it? Sometimes it seems you're stuck, you're stuck where you are. Maybe you wonder if God hears your prayers. I'm sure David had days like that. Probably many days like that. Yet he pressed into the Lord during that time. In fact, it was here at En Gedi that David wrote a lot of the beautiful psalms we read, including Psalm 63. There was only, as I, as I sat there, we walked down to that beautiful stream, and I reached down, and we all did, and put our hands in that water. It was as clear as crystal, and it was cool. And that water was coming out of that. No one else was doing it. I wanted to go over there and just sit in that waterfall so bad. And just let it refresh me and, and pour over me. You know, David said, God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. And I think about him and his men coming upon this beautiful spring gushing with living water, fresh, cool, abundant, refreshing, life-giving water. And I can just imagine David penning those words. And I want to say this to you, my friends. Whenever we are walking through hard seasons of life, and maybe we think that we aren't going to make it, maybe there are days we wonder if God hears our prayers, maybe we wonder how long we have to wait to make it through, remember in getting Remember that we have a Savior who gives us life. And life-giving water that never runs dry. Never 
runs dry. Remember the woman at the well that I mentioned to the children this morning? Jesus, by divine appointment, encountered the Samaritan woman at the well. Her life was a mess. She had one broken relationship after another. As we read about this encounter, we see that Jesus knew everything about this woman. He knew that she had, had five husbands. None of them worked out. And she was living with a man presently who was not her husband. But I want you to know today that Jesus sought her out. He went to that well by divine appointment because he wanted to meet this woman. When nothing else could satisfy, when every other relationship fell through and left her empty, Jesus offered her a relationship with himself. He offered her life abundant and eternal. He offered her what only he could do in her life. And that was quench the deep longing and need that she felt deep within her soul. He still offers this living water to those who are thirsty today. How many of you know that? Maybe life has drained you. Maybe you feel like um, every bit of life has been pulled out of you. And maybe you feel like there's no hope. But I've got good news for you. The Lord can satisfy your heart and the deep places that nothing else will. John chapter 7 and verse 38. These are Jesus' words. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. You see, in this dry and broken and messed up world we live in, there is a stream of living water. His name is Jesus. And he wants to come and reside within your very soul and your spirit and bring that gushing, refreshing water out every single day to help you make it, to refresh your soul and give you life. What a Savior. Amen? And I'm going to move quickly. I want to point out a few other things to you. Not only is God a personal God and He is a life-giving God, He is proven. He is proven. Look at verse 2. David said, So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life my lips will pray shall praise you you see david he knew enough of the lord he knew his loving kindness he knew his grace he knew his sustaining power and it brought his lips to bring praise to god here he is in that place in that arid desert running for his life but he still believed and knew and rested in the loving kindness of god who brought him life every single day. He is proven. And David calls to mind former experiences in the sanctuary. You know, one of the greatest things we can do when we are in a tough place is to recount the goodness of the Lord. It is, to, uh, it is good to remember all that God has done for us, his faithfulness and his love. Remember how he has provided for us and how he is providing for us. It is good to count our blessings and remember the goodness of God. He is faithful. He is good. He loves us. Worship him and you will discover a deep satisfaction even in the midst of your difficulties. Dear friend, you will always have difficulties. One more car or one bigger house or one more job promotion is not going to satisfy your soul. There's only one. And it is Jesus himself, the living water. David knew that his very life depended on pressing into the Lord and seeking him. And that's what he was doing. And we can do the same. David learned that not only is he proven, he is incomparable. He is incomparable. Look at verse 3. 
because your loving kindness is better than life. You know what he was saying? Nothing is better than you, Lord. Your loving kindness is better than life itself. Nothing is as good as you because your loving kindness. How many of you know that the Lord's loving kindness is upon you and it is better than life? I heard the testimony of a former member of ISIS, a Muslim with a lot of hatred in his heart. You know, one of the things they tell us to do, just a side note real quick. One of the things they tell us to do is to pray for the Muslims to have a vision of Jesus. Do you know why we're told to pray that? Because they are. And many are coming to faith in Christ, such as the man I'm telling you about, a former member of ISIS, a, a Muslim with a heart full of hatred, and he had a vision of Christ. And he didn't know who he was. He had a vision of Christ. And, and in his testimony, he felt this overwhelming love and forgiveness in the presence of this one. And I want to share with you what he said. He said, I didn't understand. I didn't understand how it could be possible. Because Allah is forgiving and merciful, but you cannot know this forgiveness until the day of judgment, and so you hope so. You hope he's going to be forgiving and merciful. And so he has this vision of Jesus, and he said, so I said, who are you that forgives me, and I feel forgiven today? And he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. He said, I did not understand what that means. I had never heard that before. And so I said, what is your name? And he said, I am Jesus Christ, the living God. And he said, I just fell on the floor and wept. The whole time he was telling this testimony, he was weeping. He was wiping tears as fast as he could wipe. Oh, friend, Jesus Christ is the living God. He's incomparable. And there is none that compares to him. There is nothing that can compare. And he is saving souls today. He is giving life to all who believe in him. This man experienced forgiveness as he encountered Jesus the Christ. Do you know that Christianity is the only religion where we cannot earn our way to heaven by good works? Instead, God came down to us to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, the God-man. He lived a sinless and perfect life in every way. He himself went to the cross to pay our sin debt. Jesus paid the price. And now by believing in him, we can have forgiveness and abundant and eternal life with him forevermore. Our God is incomparable. Jesus Christ is incomparable. No one or nothing else compares to his grandeur, his holiness, his love, or the salvation he so freely offers to anyone who will believe. And he is rich. Verse 5, David said, my soul shall be satisfied as with the marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Friend, there is nothing lacking in the Lord. He is able to satisfy our deepest needs and longings. He not only provides what we need, but we find in him the richest, most rewarding relationship that sustains us. He brings us joy. What is life like without with what is life like with Jesus? Well, it's not always easy but it is so rich and rewarding Jesus himself said if we would follow him we would have to deny ourselves and take up our crosses and follow him daily but friend nothing can compare in this world to the joy and peace of knowing our blessed Savior are you satisfied 
Do you have that deep down soul satisfaction of knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Or do you feel empty? Nothing in this world has satisfied. There is one who offers living water. Would you believe in Jesus today? Would you ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit? And would you be willing to lean into the Lord daily and follow him? No one or anything will ever satisfy your soul like Jesus. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you've never met him, you can meet him today. You can believe in him today and be saved. If you're willing to acknowledge your sin and say, Lord, forgive me. If you're willing to let go of your sin and turn to the Savior today, tell him. And then just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God who died on the cross for me. Forgive me and help me to live for you from this day forward. Lord Jesus, I believe. you prayed that prayer from the sincerity of your heart to his, he heard that prayer and he just saved your soul. That begins a relationship with him. A relationship that will be that living water that gushes from your very being and sustains you day by day. He is enough. In just a moment we're going to begin to sing. And Benji's going to lead us. If you prayed that prayer today and you've never done that before, I want to ask you to do something. I want to ask you when the music begins to play that you would step out and come and take me by the hand and say, Pastor, I just prayed that prayer with you. I want to, I want to ask you to do that. Take a step of faith and begin to grow in your faith. Lord Jesus, we give this time of invitation to you. May your perfect will be done in every heart and in every life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.